And if you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, the final three verses. The final three verses. Aaron texted me earlier and said it's bittersweet. Sweet because we have richly enjoyed this book, but bitter because eventually we do have to move on to other sections of Scripture. And yet I I pray this morning it will be the sweetness that in particular we enjoy. We've all had the experience of being out to eat at some point and a waiter asking as the meal is drawing to a close, did anyone save room for dessert? I'm sure you've had that experience. Sometimes I think they would be wiser to provide less food earlier um, so that 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 answer uh, is more often in the affirmative. Did anyone save room for the dessert? Desserts come at the end of the meal. They provide a rich conclusion to the appetizers and the entrees. And like desserts, the final greetings of the letters of the New Testament provide a a rich conclusion to the main course of the letter. Like desserts, in these final phrases of these epistles, there is a a richness, a concise intensity to every phrase. And yet, unlike desserts, the endings of his letters are nutritious. They aren't to be enjoyed with a sort of guilty pleasure. No, they can just be enjoyed. They are beneficial. They are as beneficial as the rest of the letter, and yet they do provide a kind of concise sweetness at the end. They often include some of the main themes of the letter packed into a few final phrases, and this closing greeting from Paul to this dear Philippian church is no exception. So, I would encourage us to leave room for the theological desserts at the end of the letters of the New Testament. They are profound teaching, partially because Paul intentionally wants to leave his readers with something. What someone puts at the end is very important because it's the final word they remember. It's the final communication. And this ending is no exception. Paul wants to leave the Philippian church with some of the main themes that he has been proclaiming for the last four chapters. Paul's theme in this book is that Christ is life. The theme is summarized in chapter 1 where Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain because when I die I will go and see Christ face to face. And he has unpacked that main course throughout this letter, and in the end, he reinforces the joy, the privilege, the richness of our life in Christ, even in his final greeting to the Philippian church. So, as we read these three verses, let's anticipate them the same way we would anticipate that final dessert at the end of a great meal, especially since they're going to reinforce the very rich theme of our life in Christ that Paul has been proclaiming over these four chapters. Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. This final greeting can be divided into two sections, greetings in Christ and grace from Christ. Greetings in Christ and grace from Christ. I trust that description is quite obvious based on the reading of these three verses. See, Paul greets them and then he commends them. He blesses them. We might say he prays for them with the final verse, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to zero in on on something that we, we might overlook 
And that is just the explicit emphasis on Christ Jesus throughout this book. I said just a moment ago that the theme of Philippians is to live is Christ, is that our, our Christian life is centered on, it is focused on the person of Christ. But lest we think that's just something we have discerned uh, that's not obvious in the book, just flip back in your, in your Bibles to the beginning of this letter. I just want to run through the letter quickly that we've been enjoying and just point out how central Christ Jesus as the Savior and Lord is to Paul's thinking as he instructs his church. So go back all the way to verse 1 and just notice something with me. Notice the emphasis on Christ Jesus. Paul and Timothy, Paul writes at the beginning, servant of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the first two verses, there are three references to Christ Jesus. Then if you go a little further down, you notice in verse 6, Paul says that the good work begun in the Philippians will be brought to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So all of history will be culminated in Jesus Christ. Then he says he yearned for them with the affection of Christ in verse 8. They're to be made pure and blameless for the day of Christ, verse 10. They're to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, verse 11. Then in verse 13, uh, Paul points out that the whole imperial guard has come to know that his imprisonment is for Christ. Then as he goes down and talks about the effect on the church, you notice that the former, some Christians are proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition, but Paul is satisfied because in every way, in verse 18, Christ is proclaimed. He keeps going. Verse 19, through their prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, this will turn out for his deliverance, but he's not going to be ashamed because he knows that Christ will be honored in his body. For me, he says, here's the theme verse in 21, to live is Christ. His desire is to depart and be with Christ. 23, verse 26, he wants them to have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, the overarching command, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Verse 29, it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. That's just chapter 1. The Christian life is all about Christ. That's why it's called the Christian life. This is Paul's passionate theme. Paul can't long talk of anything, whether it's suffering or obedience or the end of the world or serving one another or legalism and rejecting false religions or caring for our brothers and sisters in Christ. He can't talk about any of those things without drawing it back to Christ Jesus. And he is relentless in this Christ-centeredness, even to the final three verses verses of the letter. Did you notice this? There are three final verses after a letter full of Christ, Christ, Christ. What does he say even to the very end? Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. If we take just Paul's writing repetition as an example for us, we would be saying this. Everything in the Christian life and thinking is to be tied to Jesus Christ. Everything, everything. And we should take this as an example for ourselves. If we use Paul as an example, th there should be no part of our Christian life that we are able to connect to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So for Paul, parenting should be connected to giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to children. And marriage should be connected to displaying the gospel as husbands and wives. And serving should be connected to Christ Jesus who served uh, us by offering us salvation. Everything, the way we think about the future, should be connected to Christ Jesus returning to gather his people. Exhortations to obedience should be connected to modeling our lives after the godliness of Jesus Christ. Our hope for reconciliation with God should be connected to Jesus Christ as our righteousness. Listen, brothers and sisters, there is nothing in the Christian life that should not be tied to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Even Paul's final greeting, he doesn't just say goodbye. In his final greeting, he wants to reinforce again their identity in Jesus Christ. He wants them to enjoy the richness of their life in Christ 
one final time. Now, anyone who has been coming to this church for any length of time, uh, you can easily, like I can, you can be nodding your head, yes, yes, I know this is about Jesus, and nodding your head, yes. But there's a difference between a, a sort of an analytical affirmation, yes, I, I agree with that. I, I, intellectually, I agree this would be about Jesus Christ. And personally, seeing the centrality of Christ to your life. So before we get into the details, let me just make this overarching point. Is the richness of our identity in Christ the center of your Christian life? Is the centrality of Jesus Christ and his work, Jesus the person, the Savior, the one who rescued us and who will come back to take us to himself, is that the center of your mental and emotional Christian life? There are many other good things in the Christian life. That There is Bible reading and prayer and evangelism and obedience and marriage and parenting and, and church community and global witness. Many other good themes, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin. All biblical themes, but, but they should all center on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so should the life of the Christian. Paul would count it, I think we could almost say, a lack of accuracy if he were to greet these Christians with anything less than a reminder of their Christian identity, being in Christ. Do we feel that same burden with ourselves and with one another? When we see a brother or a sister in Christ, are, are we wanting to ensure, are you in touch with the richness of your life in Christ, that you belong to Jesus, that he has rescued you and claimed you for himself? Husbands, are we this determined with our wives to make sure that their identity in Christ is being richly enjoyed, even to the final phrases of a letter that's already been packed with Christ Jesus? Wives, are we thinking this way for the husbands that make sure, is, is your identity in Christ being richly enjoyed? Parents, are we thinking this way with our children, either those that know the Lord or those that do not yet know the Lord, that Christ is the center of our communication, who he is, what he's done, why that matters? In our relationships with those who do not know the Lord Jesus as Lord, are we thinking of Christ as the center of that conversation? Paul is determined. He is Christ-centered to the last, we might say. To the end, to the final words, he wants to be Christ-centered. Paul is ruthlessly determined that Christ will be at the center of everything he says. He has a lot to say, but he wants Christ to be the center of it all. He wants the richness of their life in Christ to be enjoyed with every bite of theology, every moment of life. He wants Christ to be right there at the center. Listen, if you've been a Christian any length of time, this is in particular your responsibility to ensure that the younger believers around you are centering their life on Christ because there's a lot of other good things they could focus on. Zeal for godliness is good, but it must be centered on and grounded in Christ. A prayer life is good, but it must be sheltered by and founded upon Christ. Evangelism is good, but it must flow from a relationship with Christ. Purity is good, but it must flow out of a respect for and fear of Christ. So let me speak especially to mature Christians this morning. Do you have the same determination that Paul did? to make sure Christ and his work is at the center of every part of the Christian life. Even to the final greeting, Paul will not let it go. Let's look at these two sections where Paul's centering them again on the person and work of Christ. Greetings in Christ and then grace from Christ. Paul's final greetings, verses 21 and 22 do a number of things even as they say goodbye. First of all, they remind the believers of the privilege of their identity as holy ones who belong to Christ Jesus. Notice this phrase, greet every saint in Christ. All the saints greet you. That word saint uh, could just be translated holy one. It is not a select 
number of Christians who are particularly godly. It is simply the way that the New Testament describes a person who has put their faith in Jesus and has been set apart as a follower of God. That's what a saint is. A, a set-apart one who follows the Lord. And I think we get a clue that that's the meaning when it says every saint in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ Jesus is to be a saint. It is to be set apart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Greet every saint. So he's saying right from the outset, brothers, you are one of the holy ones of God. And that's particularly relevant given that this Philippian church is probably largely Gentile believers, non-Jews, who did not grow up uh, reading the Jewish Torah or a part of the Mosaic tradition. They probably grew up worshiping idols and loving the Roman culture. And he's saying, you are the holy ones of God in Christ Jesus. He's reminding them of their position, their calling in Christ Jesus, even in how he names them. Notice also his greeting is to be given to every one of them. Greet every saint in Christ. In a letter that's been emphasizing unity and humility, it's not surprising that Paul would be at pains to make sure that there is no rivalry or superiority in the church. He wants every saint to know and every saint to hear that he is greeting them all in Christ. If you remember the message about these two women, Yodia and Syntyche, who were arguing, Paul is saying, greet Yodia in Christ and greet Syntyche also in Christ. He's leveling any presumed superiority in the church. You are all saints in Christ Jesus. His greeting is to be given to every one of them, reminding them of the unity and camaraderie they share in Christ. He's not singling out some as more important or more valuable. In a letter where he has urged unity, it's not surprising that he wants to remind them of the foundation of their unity in Christ Jesus. Notice his greeting is repeated from the brothers, probably a reference to leaders, co-workers, who are literally there with Paul. We might think of Timothy, for example, or Luke, who had served him at other times. Timothy is literally there with him, and he's wanting them to know you are on the hearts of these leaders as well. I'm not singling myself out as caring about you, Philippian church. The brothers who are with me also greet you. That word greet in the Greek has has connotations of embrace. We we, we probably don't want to think of our kind of stiff, formal American greetings. Uh, We want to think of a a Mediterranean greeting with a lot more affection included. That's what Paul has in mind, a, a more affectionate family greeting, a family embrace here, he's saying. Big hug across the miles from the brothers who are with me. And notice all the saints. So this would be the entire church in Rome. All the saints greet you. So he wants them to know you are included not only in Christ, but in the family of Christ around the globe. You are included, Philippian church. Just because you're a a smaller colony compared to Rome, or you're a a later church plant compared to the Jerusalem church, it doesn't mean you're any less included in the global family of Christ Jesus. And all the church here has you on their heart. You are greeted. You are included. The word could also be translated welcomed. You You are embraced in Christ Jesus by the entirety of the church. And especially, he says, those of Caesar's household. That phrase, Caesar's household, probably doesn't mean Caesar's immediate relatives. It probably refers to his official household, those servants that did his tasks in various places in the empire. It's a reminder of chapter 1 where Paul says that the entire imperial guard has come to know that he's in prison for Christ. So (laughs) contrary to all expectations, Paul being in prison has actually served to advance the gospel even into the official household of Caesar Augustus, the ruler of the known world. So the gospel has made progress even to those who you would think would be loyal to Caesar who was called Lord and Savior. But apparently, some of his very own servants have a new Lord and Savior And those saints want to send greetings to the Philippian church because Philippi was an official Roman city. And they want them to know, we are with you. 
Though in a human sense we are under the domain of Caesar, yet we are with you in calling Jesus Lord and Savior. Though, like you, we face the difficulties of living in a world where the the emperor is supreme and even worshipped, yet we are with you and we greet and embrace you over the miles as those who claim Jesus as Lord. Now, what is the effect of these greetings? What's Paul trying to get done? They're sweet, and they're kind, and they're rich, and they're loving, but what are they trying to get done? Paul wants to remind them that they are united in Christ to those that also belong to Christ in Rome. Their stand for Christ, their allegiance to Jesus as their Lord, is not an isolated mission. They are united to all of God's people. They belong to this Christian community, not just locally, but beyond their borders as well. He wants them to know of the affection and unity that they have, even with Christians, all the way in Rome. They emphasize their calling and their community status in the body of Christ around the world. It links them in to this global fellowship in Christ. God has called them to to himself. They are saints, and he has called them to his global people. They are one of the family of Christ around the world. Now, this greeting is meant in the Lord's providence to shape how we think of ourselves as well. It's, It's meant to affect the richness of our own self-identity. Because this is God's word. He didn't write these letters only for Philippian believers. He wrote wrote them for Texonian believers as well. He, he, He wrote them for you. He wrote them to remind you of the richness of your status in Christ. These greetings in the providence of God also greet you. We might even say God is greeting his church every time this letter is read. And he is reminding them that they belong not just to him, but to one another. How do we think of ourselves? Do you think of yourself as something less than a holy one of God? Perhaps you think of yourselves as merely attending a church service or claiming a Christian religious status, but but maybe somehow out of full membership in the Christian community. Have you ever been somewhere where you got a a temporary visitor badge? Perhaps a a gym that you're thinking of joining at some point. They give you a a temporary badge. And we we came to the school to, to take a tour. We were given a temporary visitor badge. It says you can be here sometimes. You can occasionally be present. And sometimes I I think we treat the Christian community in life that way, or we we think perhaps others are viewing us as a a temporary visitor. We we occasionally attend. We show up on some occasion, but we're, we're not staff. We're not included in that kind of central, essential quality. We we wouldn't be the kind of person that someone would think to greet writing a letter from across the miles. We're, we're, we're attending, but we are not affectionately participating. We're not a part of. But this letter, this greeting, is intended to say, all of you are a part of this global family of Christ. You are all to be encompassed in this warm, affectionate greeting All the brothers greet each one of you. All the saints of this church greet each one of you. So let me speak to you. If if you think of yourself as a fringe Christian, a temporary status Christian, maybe a cultural Christian, this greeting was extended to Every person in the Philippian church. It's extended to every Christian who has joined themselves to that church. That they, they, they need to know you are included. You are on the heart of the apostle and of the fellow leaders and of the church. You are included. You are welcomed in this embrace. You are hugged in this big family huddle. 
Listen, let me, let me speak to you. If, if you battle loneliness or feeling like you are on the outskirts, you're never fully included, listen, this letter is full of a warm embrace for Christians that you are a full-fledged member of the community. That if you've joined yourself to this local church, I'm not trying to put pressure. If, you're just, if you literally are a visitor here, look, welcome. We're glad that you're here. You're welcome to attend. You don't have to join the church the first Sunday. Uh, but if you're a member, let me, let me communicate to you. You are included. There is no half membership at Redemption Hill. There's no partial membership. There's no sort of, well, you're a fringe member, and let us know when you want the full rights of membership. You can come on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but not Saturdays. No, no, you are welcomed. You're included. Now, that comes also with responsibilities, that you are included. You are included in this embrace. You're included in this membership, this participation in the global family. And and brothers and sisters, that also means that you are a part of the global family of Christ. The Philippians were to think of themselves as connected to the church in Rome. They were to think of themselves as participants in that global mission. A Christian who thinks of themselves exclusively in terms of their own Christian life is missing the doctrine of the church. A Christian who thinks of their Christian life exclusively in terms of their local church is missing the global church. You cannot read the New Testament and be satisfied with a purely local view of the Christian life and mission. It simply isn't biblical. Because the Bible is full of these kinds of references of of extra local, even global participation. That every Christian has some connection to the global mission. That's why we count it as part of our pastoral responsibility to point out the ways that our church is connected to that global mission. Point out tangible ways that we link arms with our brothers and sisters around the world. Now, we can't support every church and and every believer everywhere, but we are united to them by faith, and we want tangible ways where we can reflect this kind of global mindset in the family of God. It also affects how we view the wider body of Christ. Paul wants the Philippians to know that they are on the hearts of the apostle as well as leaders and Christians in Rome. They are united with Christians in Caesar's service in their determination to stand firm for Christ. They are not to think of themselves in isolation. They are to think of themselves connected to those believers. This letter has emphasized this extra local unity from the beginning And here, it is reinforced at the end. And often I find that to be the case. If you look at Paul's letters, you can notice this affectionate, extra-local family mindset at the beginning and at the end of many of his letters. If you read the letter to Romans, for example, you have that same beginning and end of relational affection. Let me ask this important question. Brother, sister in Christ... Are you affectionately focused on your global family in Christ? Is that a part of your Christian identity? Paul wants it to be. He does not think of this Philippian church as to be focused exclusively on their own ministries and their own local outreach, though that certainly is a major part of their calling. He wants them to have a global vision, an extra-local vision that extends beyond their normal daily routines. Now, not all of them are called to go to Rome, but they are called to look to Rome and to receive from this this Roman church in this case. Brothers and sisters, we, we are called to have this global body of Christ mindset as a part of our Christian identity. This is part of the richness. You are a part of something much bigger than yourself. You participate in something much bigger than yourself. There are people around this world who care about you, and you should care about them. If that's never been a part of what it means for you to be a Christian, let me encourage you to study the extra-local relationships in the New Testament. For example, in this passage. The, the, the whole pattern of New Testament teaching is built into this context of extra-local, mission-minded vision. And 
it is sweet. It is rich. It does something to your soul to think about our friend Barnabas in Nepal preaching the same gospel. It does something to your soul to pray for our friend Carlos and Juarez preaching the same gospel. It does something to your soul to think about the new church plant that's happening in in Bolivia. It it does something because it reminds you that Christ Jesus is bigger then Williamson County is bigger than Austin, is bigger than America. It, it reminds you of his greatness to think about those believers who are faithfully suffering and serving Christ in other lands. To greet them in your heart, in your prayers, and even, even officially where you have that opportunity does something to your whole. It, it, it shows us the richness and the grandeur of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ that will not be limited to this building this city, this country, this generation, this hemisphere. These are not throwaway goodbyes. They are a rich, nourishing theological dessert that's meant to inform us and nourish us in our identity in Christ that includes our participation in the global family of Christ. Parents, let me encourage you, make this a part of your parenting. Talk about how the church is progressing around the world. Look for ways to bring this identity. Children especially, they they need, their minds need to be expanded to see the breadth and grandeur of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to not think of it as merely a personal, individual walk that happens when you individually attend church on Sunday, but it's something God is doing around the world and over the ages. Paul wants them to be aware of this privilege, this affection, this greeting, this inclusion over the miles. Brothers, he says, Philippian brothers, you are greeted from the church here in Rome. I want you to know that. Not just me, but all the saints greet you. You share with them this identity. You share with them this mission. You share with them this cause. Feast on the richness of that membership. And remember the source of it. Section two, grace from Christ. Grace from From Christ. Look at Paul's final phrase that we have in Scripture to this dear church the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This word, grace, is a feast in and of itself, isn't it? It's a feast. It's a Thanksgiving feast in and of itself. It's it's a dessert that is nourishing and is somehow sweet and a a superfood all at the same time. It's, It's a feast in and of itself, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's very intentional that Paul juxtaposes Lord and Caesar. He's just declaring that in contrast to Caesar who calls himself the Lord, there is a real Lord. A a real Kyrios, a, a real Lord, a real sovereign. An emperor who rules over all things, who has absolute power and dominion, who has the cattle on a thousand hills and the planets of a thousand galaxies. There is this one Lord. And to that Lord, Paul says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord over all. He is the emperor. He is the sovereign. And what does that sovereign give to this Philippian church and to every church? Grace. Grace, he gives. Grace, the the unmerited favor of the all-powerful God. The unmerited favor of the all-powerful God. The, The kind of favor that makes 
all the difference. The kind of love that is not based on their righteousness. The kind of kindness that will not flag when they falter. The kind of disposition that is looking for them and their weakness to lift them up. The kind of love that wants to welcome them into the family room of heaven. Grace, the grace of the Lord be with your spirits, Philippian church. Grace. Grace to you. Grace to you. Grace be with you. Now, Paul is not causing the Lord to be gracious. You notice these kind of benedictions that happen. They're not the cause of God's grace. They are praying for God to do what he has already promised to do. You can be sure you are praying in line with the will of God when you pray for the grace of the Lord Jesus to be with his people. It is a a declaration prayer over them. It's a reminder to them of the the most central richness of this identity in Christ Jesus. That to be in Christ is to receive the grace of his lordship. We could think, for example, of a, a, a very rare situation where you stand before one of the sovereigns of this age. And you desperately need their favor. Have you ever, have you ever stood before maybe a, a very, very small kind of sovereign, say like at the DMV, um, w- where you go there and you're just aware of the power they wield. Uh, in this one moment, I just need this one thing. I just need one thing. I, I just need you to grant this one thing, but you ultimately have the ability to do this or to delay this. And I really want you to do this And you sense that absolute helplessness in that moment, right? Well, let's advance that to the person who is a a criminal, rightly accused, who's looking for pardon. Let's advance that to the the traitor, rightly accused, who's looking for a commuting of their death penalty. Let's translate that to the, the, the renegade who comes before the emperor of all peoples, whose very life, and future and well-being is in his hands. And we have something of what is on Paul's mind when he says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, these folks were much more familiar with a sense of, of absolute helpless dependence that people in this culture would be used to. They're not used to thinking of rights and legal protections and balances of power and things that we enjoy in this country. You're used to thinking, look, there is one guy, and he's going to make all the difference. It is completely up to him. And whatever he does, there's no recourse for it. There's no objection to it. There's no overruling. There's no court of appeals. There's no Supreme Court. There's no law. It's up to him and him alone. That's who the Lord is. Paul says, the grace of the Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, we have been brought into a relationship of sovereign grace. Sovereign so that nothing can stop it. Grace so that it isn't based on what we deserve. Sovereign grace, this is the richness of the life that we have in Christ, that we, you, you, experience the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace that was purchased and demonstrated by his death for sinners so that their sins are not counted against them. The grace that was revealed most clearly when he succumbed willingly to death in order to pay for your sins. The grace that flows over you and me as Christians because there is now nothing held against you in the court of heaven. The grace that comes to you in your weakness and loves you in spite of your unworthiness that loves you in spite of your failures, in spite of your mistakes, in spite of your impatience, is patient towards you, in spite of your anger, is loving towards you, in spite of your pride, is gracious and gentle with you. This is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the richness of your life in Christ. The Lord of the galaxies is gracious towards you. What does Paul want them to know as he parts from them? Grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. 
This is the grace that forgives our sin and strengthens us to grow in holiness. This is the grace that draws us to the Lord and away from the false treasures of this earth. This is the grace that shows us the authority of God's word and reveals the lies of sin and Satan. This is the grace that welcomes us into the very throne room of God himself to know God himself as our Father through the adoption of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the grace that flows to us from the death of Christ, whose blood paid for our sins, and who ever lives to intercede for us as our mediator with God himself. This is the grace of the king on his throne, welcoming us into his very throne room, watching over your needs, marking your sufferings, noting your trials. Aware of your tears, holding us up when we stumble, guarding us from temptations of the evil one, standing for us when darkness comes our way. This is the same grace that held up David in the wilderness and Job in his trial. It's the grace that guarded Joseph when he was falsely accused and gave Peter and Paul strength to face their final martyrdom. This is the grace that has watched over the church through the centuries, that even now sustains Nepalese Christians as they bravely witness for Christ and risk imprisonment for baptizing new believers. This is the grace that is available to us every time we want to witness to others in the name of Jesus. This is the grace that is available to every mother as she trains her child in the way of the Lord. It is available to every father as he leads his home in righteousness and holiness. To every Christian allowing them to say no to ungodliness and unrighteous passions. And to say yes to righteousness and the fear of the Lord. This is the grace that is given to Christians to count others more significant than themselves. This is the grace that helps even the poorest Christians to give generously to the advance of the kingdom. This grace rejects all legalism and self-trust and helps us to look to Christ alone for our salvation. This is the grace that helps Christians die with a smile on their face because they're going to see Jesus. This is the same grace that anointed Spurgeon and Whitfield and Carey and Edwards and Luther and Calvin This is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is stronger than any force on this earth. It is higher than any mountain, deeper than any ocean, watchful in every night and new with every morning. This is the grace that Paul prays over and reminds the Philippian church of. What's Paul doing as he ends this letter? He's giving them one last moment. Save room for it, he says. Save room for it to live as Christ. Let me remind you why. You're a saint. You're God's holy one included in his holy community around the world. You've been given a more privileged membership than you would ever possibly have imagined. From outcast, you are a member of the household. From a scattered stone, you are now part of the temple that God is building around this globe. You now have a membership that connects you with Christians in China and Nepal and Bolivia and Brazil and England and other parts of this country. You are a full member if you're a Christian of that community. And that community is covered by grace. You didn't earn your way in. And you still don't deserve to be here. It's a community of grace. Listen, if you're here and you're just attending, you don't know if you're a Christian, I need to tell you that this dessert is for you if you believe in Jesus. You also can be called a holy one of God. Not because you are holy, but because he calls you that in Christ Jesus. You also can have your sins forgiven. You also can receive the favor of God himself. And you can be included in a global family. 
Listen, if you repent of your sins and claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today you can be a full-fledged member of the body of Christ around the world and through the ages. So please do that. Don't get up from the table and leave and miss out the entire meal out of stubbornness or pride or reluctance. Look, you are invited to this feast. Christ Jesus himself invites you to come. And we invite you to come too. Brothers and sisters, there is a life in Christ that we have been given. It is centered on the person and work of Jesus. It is fulfilled and accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection. It is headed towards his return. It looks now to reflect the glory of his coming. It looks to showcase who he is and what he has done with every interaction and every morning when we rise and say, Christ is my life today. And when we sleep and say, Christ is my life this evening and Christ will be my life forever. That is the goal and purpose of this book, to make Christ in all of his richness and glory and beauty and majesty, the center of our life, to make his grace our greatest anthem, to make his glory our goal, to make his coming our longing, to make his body our family. This is what Paul has been preaching. May Christ be more our life now than it was when we started reading this book. May we know him more and love him more and want to see more of him now as we respond to Paul's preaching to the Philippian church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is no one like you. We declare as a church that for us to live is Christ. And to die, whenever it's time for us to die, will be gain because we will see you face to face. Lord, I pray that you would draw our hearts to you. Draw us away from every false treasure of this world. Help us to enjoy the richness and sweetness of your glory. Help us to see it on every page in your word. Help us to delight in it in our conversations and in our witness. Help us to love the glory of our life in you. Be glorified, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for the gift of this book. Lord, thank you for it. Lord, let us to return to it often in our private study and devotions. May our church look a little more like this incredible Philippian church. May it look a little more like Paul's teaching in this book. Lord, transform us according to this part of your word. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.